Dr. Lisa and I have known each other since when I was 12, and uh, <laughs> we were in residency together at Georgetown in family medicine. Um, Lisa has always been an avid athlete. Uh, she held the women's uh, record for deadlift in the state of Maryland for a number of years. I don't know if, it's, if anybody ever broke that or not. Uh, but uh, she teaches spin classes. Uh, she's an avid yoga practitioner and uh, is getting her certification in teaching yoga as well. Lisa's also taught meditation and uh, practices meditation on a regular basis and practices what she preaches. In the, in the office, uh, she uh, specializes in, in bioidentical hormones and uh, women's medicine, but she's a family physician, so see everybody from little kids all the way through a lifespan. Uh, and uh, she brings to the, the addition to uh, straight family medicine this whole realm of integrative medicine uh, and expertise in acupuncture. Uh, so she's got a great deal of depth and breadth in terms of not just family medicine, but of the type of physician that I believe all of us will be evolving to in the future. It is my great pleasure to turn this over to Dr. Lisa and uh, welcome her this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Can everybody hear me if I don't stand in front of the podium? Is everybody okay if I talk like this? If you, just let me know if you, if you need me to stand in front of the, the microphone. So this subject came up um, on my last lecture. It was naturally healthy bones and someone, uh, as, as they were filling out the survey at the end, you, you'll be asked what you'd like to hear in the future. And someone filled out getting older and learning not to hate it. Is, any, is that person in the audience? <laughs> no. OK, I think it's a great subject because it, I kept thinking about it. Because I hear it, and I, as you know, it's a popular topic here. You know, I think there's a fear of getting older, and, the, and especially around pain. So um, I want to alleviate that fear and give hope and, and empower you to take control of your life and not to be fearful. But speaking of fear, this was a Time Magazine article. This was 2004, The Secret Killer, The Surprising Link Between Inflammation and Heart Attacks, Cancer, Alzheimer's, and Other Diseases, What You Can Do to Fight It. So we're going to talk about what you can do to fight it. Um, but, and inflammation is the buzzword. You know, we can group a lot of all the aging diseases as inflammatory diseases. So we'll discuss nutrition and active lifestyle and how we can decrease our inflammation. Neurophysiology and neuroplasticity, what we can do to change the way we think so we can be happier. We'll talk about the um, importance of social connectedness and also discuss the future of medicine and longevity. So here are some sobering statistics before we get into the positives. The obesity rate in Japan is 3%. In France, it's 11% and it's 32% in the United States. Uh, the, risk, the definition of obesity is a body mass index of greater than 30. Um, also, you can easily measure waist measurements uh, greater than 40 um, inches in men and 35 in women. It means that there's increased abdominal fat and this is um, an inflammatory condition. And this increases your risks of, of the of the diseases that we talked about. So inflammation is responsible for cardiovascular diseases, Alzheimer's, diabetes, arthritis, autoimmune dis diseases, neurologic diseases, and pulmonary diseases. So let's meet a couple centenarians. This is Dr. Ephraim Engelman. He's 102 years old from San Mateo, California, and he still sees patients. And when asked his advice about longevity, he says, stay happy, stay young, and breathe. Sounds quite obvious, but if you think about it, that's pretty, pretty wise. Really think about it. This is Misao Okawa. She holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the oldest living woman, uh, 116 years old, and her advice is eat sushi, sleep eight hours, and relax. Also very wise. So she's part of the Okinawan 
centenarian uh, study that's been going on since 1975. Um, they're uh, reviewing or studying nine over 900 centenarians, and um, they have the lowest level of diseases, um, so they have great longevity. Um, so they, their life expectancy is the longest um, in the world. So this is, as you can see, the US is down here. Um, then Sweden, Japan, and Okinawa. They have the lowest prevalence of dementia, as you can see the lower, lower, lower line. They also have low leg levels of um, free radicals. What are free radicals? They're unstable molecules that um, accelerate aging. So they cause, vital, they cause organ damage and this leads to, this accumulates over time. And it can be neutralized by eating anti oxidant foods, foods that are high in antioxidants, such as vitamin C, E, and, and beta carotene. But, it's but it, the free radicals increase with inflammatory foods, like saturated fats, trans, fat, trans fats, foods that have high glycemic index, uh, that raise your blood sugar, raise your insulin level, and other processed foods. Also smoking, excess alcohol, and environmental toxins, pollution, um, biotoxicity, heavy metals, all increase the free radicals. So what's the secret with these Okinawans? They practice something called hara hachibu. This means eat till 80% full. How many of us eat mindlessly in front of the computer, in front of the TV, at your desk? <laughs> I, I do that myself. I eat at my desk. And every time I do it, I think about you know, this is, I should be concentrating on my food, feeling how full I am, not gobbling it down, not thinking of something else, but we, we all do that. Also, um, they eat small portions, so the Okinawans, they eat um, fewer calories because of this harahachibu, and they eat small portions on pretty plates, and the type of foods they eat are fish, fruits and vegetables, and lots of antioxidants like seaweed, soy. So I always marvel at, a, at a, a Japanese meal. You start with miso soup, so you have your broth, so you're a little full, and you have your tofu, and then you have your, your uh, fish, and seaweed, and ginger for, for digestion. You know, they really think about it. The Americans don't, not so much. <clears throat> also, they're very active. So this is a 97-year-old karate master. So what about fish? What is so good about fish, omega-3s? There's a couple studies I want to, to, to cite. One is, uh, was in 2012. It was published in Journal of Neurology. Um, they followed about a thousand, a few, little over a thousand uh, women that were in their 70s. They did MRIs and they measured omega-3 levels. They found that those that had the highest omega-3 levels um, ended up having more brain volume and larger hippocampus. And hippocampus has to do with a memory. Another study, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is, these are uh, pictures of chromosomes and telomeres. So telomeres are the end caps of the DNA on the chromosome. And as we get older, the telomeres shorten. And it get, gets to the point where they shorten so much that the cell stops dividing. So this was a study, they um, measured omega-3 levels and they determined, I think it was a five-year study, a thousand subjects, and those that had higher omega-3 levels had less telomere shortening. So good reason to take your omega-3. So what is, uh, what are, how can you get omega-3s? One way is fish, so wild-caught salmon, mackerel, sardines, um, blanking on others, but or you can take fish oil, so at least 1,500 milligrams of EPA, DHA combined and up to 6,000. So there's a wide range of how much um, omega-3 you can take. You can also get omega-3s in flaxseed and, and chia, so it's very good. You can get ground flaxseed and chia and sprinkle it on everything and you'll get your omega-3s. So another diet that is high in omega-3s is the Mediterranean diet. And there's lots of studies that 
show this is very healthy for the brain. One particular study that was published last year, there were over 7,000 um, subjects in people in, in Spain, and they all had high risk for heart disease or these inflammatory diseases. They were overweight or, or smokers or diabetic. And they, um, they divided them into the, a low-fat diet, which was difficult to follow, so it ended up being like a no diet. And the others followed the Mediterranean diet. And there, were, there was good compliance with that, that diet. There was a 30% uh, decrease of cardiovascular disease in the Mediterranean diet. They actually stopped the study before five years because it was so profound, the difference between the diets. The Mediterranean diet included fish three times a week, legumes three times a week, which are beans, lentils, and peas. Um, they had five to seven, seven servings of fresh fruit or vegetable and vegetables a day total. Uh, they had white meat only, no red meat. Um, they had also a liberal amount of of olive oil, so about a quarter cup of olive oil, um, an ounce of nuts, and um, if they drank, a glass of wine a day. So it sounds pretty good. It sounds like a, an easy diet to follow with a significant um, result. And what about a vegan diet? So there was um, a book you might remember. I think it was, pu it was published in 2005 as the China Study. And it was a collaboration between Oxford Cornell and Chinese um, Academy of Preventative Medicine. And they went into China and they followed several hundred people in the rural areas. And their conclusion was that those that ate the least amount of animal products were the healthiest. So their, their overall conclusion was that any animal products, meat, dairy, eggs, were all bad for you and they caused these inflammatory diseases. Um, also, Bill Clinton had, did the, uh, the China diet. He lost 25 pounds. I, I think he had some heart disease, and you know, he, he, I think it became popular after that. In addition, they noted that, this is from Cleveland Clinic, that um, I guess in collaboration, these, this is, they did several studies on people with atherosclerosis. So this is the left anterior descending artery, one of the very important artery in, in the heart. And this particular person has occlusion. Uh, they went on a, on a plant-based diet for 32 months, no drugs, and the atherosclerosis uh, reversed. So pretty, pretty significant here. This I just got a kick out of, um, cancer increasing among meat eaters. New York Times article in 1907. So, we, <laughs> so we've been talking about this for a long time, right? 1907. Um, so we looked at a, couple, a few different diets. I can't cover all of them. Now, paleo diet is also a popular diet, especially amongst athletes. So the paleo diet is based on Paleolithic diet more than 15,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so it is meat, um, nuts, seeds, and um, no grains, no legumes, no dairy. Um, and of course, fruits and vegetables, yes. Um, the research isn't strong on the paleo. But, you know, any, uh, uh, let me just say something about grains. So, as Dr. Kaplan mentioned, uh, about 1% of the population has celiac, absolutely cannot take any gluten at all. About 5 to 10% of people have gluten intolerance. And there is, um, so the, the wheat actually has changed over the last 70 years, and it um, has a lot more gluten in it than it, than it used to, and it's, it's causing problems, and we see that quite a bit in our patients. And it causes, can cause leaky gut. So if you're someone who is sensitive to gluten, then you need to avoid it. Um, so in that sense, the paleo could be a good diet. But I think, I, you know, I can't say which diet is the best. I think the thread is, through all of them, is lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, so what I usually recommend to patients is basically a plant-based diet. Um, limit the, the red meats and limit the wheat and then you're, you're pretty good to go. And anything that's going to decrease that inflammation is a good thing. So if, if it's gonna decrease the abdominal fat, that's, that's good. What about exercise? So this is jo Joanna Quass. 
She's an 86-year-old gymnast. And if you get a chance, go, go on YouTube and just put in 86-year-old gymnast, and she'll pop up. And just watch her in action. It is amazing the way she moves. But um, so there's tons of research about exercise and, the, and it's the effect on inflammation. Um, so weight training regulates blood sugar and diabetes and also reverses or, or builds bone density. Um, mm -hmm. Yoga can reverse osteoporosis and also great for anxiety. And aerobic exercise decreases inflammation and stroke and it goes on and on. But what about the sitting disease? You might have seen some articles on the sitting disease or sitting is the new smoking. You know, so this is a problem. It's becoming more of a problem because a lot of the jobs are sitting at the computer. So being sedentary is a risk factor. Um, so lots of research that shows that the more sedentary you are, the more these inflammatory diseases, uh, the higher the incidence is. What can we do about this? Well, if you have to sit at a computer for your job, every hour you need to get up for 10 minutes. And you can set an alarm on your computer or something up for 10 minutes. Also, you might want to sit on a stability ball. That'll keep you moving. Take walking meetings. Do not use the elevator. Use the stairs, park farther away. And the other thing I've been recommending to patients is to get an activity monitor. So there's, a, there's several out. And what they do is they monitor your steps. They also monitor your sleep. You can, there's a database of food. You can enter in your, your food intake. It'll calculate calories, proteins, carbohydrates, et cetera. Um, but it really gives you the feedback as to what, how many steps you're taking. You know, I think it's important to know that. Um, it also, uh, so it connects wirelessly to your, your smartphone or your computer. It'll also send you little articles, research articles. This morning I got a, a research article, a, an NIH study about stroke and being sedentary. I was like, cool, you know, so you're getting some real research on it. So I, I do highly recommend this.